Um, so today, hopefully, we'll have a good time. If we don't have a good time, just lie and say you did. But uh, I'm, I'm a pretty casual guy. Mark, you're allowed to ask me questions at any time if you guys want. Uh, we'll go through things. We do have a little bit of background lecture at the beginning, and then we'll get up and do some of these exercises and do some of these things. Depending on how many people we actually have in here, um, we might have to share a band, but we, we might be able to get around that. We'll see just how many we have uh, to be able to go through these things. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I am here, I am from Nebraska originally. Uh, is anyone here from Nebraska? Wow. How about anyone from a flyover state? <laughs> Do you know why they're called the flyover states? Yeah, you fly over them to nice places. But I am from Nebraska. I'm from a town called Grand Island, Nebraska, which is neither grand nor an island. Um, but it is in the center. Funny story about Grand Island. One time I was shipping something FedEx. I live out here in D.C. now, by the way, and I was shipping something FedEx to Grand Island. And the guy said, oh, we don't ship ground to islands. I said, trust me, it'll get there. Um, but I, if you see this, that's Anna Street. That's actually the street I'm from. So it's not a very big town, but uh, it is a good town. And no, and everybody doesn't know your name. I did go to Creighton University. Uh, I am a Blue Jay. I played golf at Creighton. There you go. We have a, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Well, I played golf at Creighton. Um, people always ask me, you know, okay, so you were a college golfer, Division I college golfer. Do you ever think about going pro? And I said, well, you know, Creighton's a good school, and I was a chemistry major. I'm kind of a geek. And, and I said, I, at the end of every day of golf practice, I had a choice. I can either stay in practice and become a better golfer, or I can go home and study. So the moral of the story is I was academic all conference, not all conference. Uh, I have been speaking a lot. I do a lot of speaking, uh, as Mark mentioned in my uh, bio, around the world. I have the opportunity to do that. I speak a lot for TheraBand uh, products, BioFreeze TheraBand, and, and I want to thank TheraBand for um, uh, being able to sponsor me to, to come here today. Um, and Kramer Sports Medicine has recently come under the fold of the TheraBand family of products. I am a kinesio taping instructor, so I, I do teach for kinesio taping. And I am a sports physical therapist, and in the sports physical therapy section, I'm the knee special interest group chair, and I do a lot of speaking for them. And then because I'm located in DC, how many people are here from the DC metro area? Fair amount of you, very good. So in DC, we have the opportunity to speak to a lot of government agencies like the FDA, NASA, Congress, et cetera. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I have been published in uh, a number of journals, uh, from Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy uh, to some chiropractic journals, medical science and sports exercise, and, and so on for some of the research that we've done on using uh, biofreeze to decrease pain, but also using TheraBand to be able to figure out how to find which exercises work the best uh, for the, specifically we focus on the gluteal muscles and then more recently on the neck muscles using EMG studies. My, uh, my wife, I always think it's nice little, you know, you get to know a little bit about me and hopefully, hopefully like me a little bit more. My wife is from Russia. She's from Moscow. She was a mail order bride. <laughs> Just kidding. She found me in a cornfield. Um, so she, uh, she's here from Moscow. If you ever had the chance to go to Moscow, it's a beautiful city. It's a wonderful city. It's an expensive city, but you get to see big, amazing churches like that. And then uh, these are the reasons that uh, the, my wife and kids are the reasons I get up every day. This is my son, Alexander. In true Russian form, he is eating caviar with a spoon. Um, he loves it that much. And he is a budding soccer superstar. And this is my daughter, Katerina. And she is a uh, budding pianist and, and just a, a bundle of joy. So anyway, in uh, full disclosure, I am a consultant, as you guessed, for TheraBand Biofreeze, uh, Kramer Sports Medicine, and also Future Health Software. OK, so let's go ahead and get started. So you know, you guys are. are personal trainers and, and, and exercise specialists and so on. And we're going to talk about TheraBand. And it's important that we, we make sure that when we're exercising, no matter what we're doing, that we are doing it the right way. So I just want to go ahead and show you um, one way to do something. Oh, watch this guy's reaction right there. Oh, yeah, OK, OK. Uh, how many of you have experienced that in your life? This guy's talking, he's doing his business, he's doing good. <laughs> there he goes. So that is not the right way to, uh, to do this. All right. So we have, we have distinct modes of, of resistance training. 
And we have everything from isometric, which the tension is an internal tension, to isotonic using weights, isokinetic, which has, a, has the same speed, and we have elastic resistance. Now, how many of you all use elastic resistance regularly with your clients? Okay, and so a lot of you. How many don't use it at all? And go ahead and raise your hand. That's okay. Okay, good. So we have a couple of you. You guys can leave. That's cool. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so m most of you use it regularly. Now, here's what percentage would you say that you use this? So what percentage do you use re elastic resistance? Uh, globally, could be any brand, elastic resistance. So less than 25% of your resistance exercises involve elastic resistance. Okay, how about around 50% of your resistance exercises? 75 and 100. Okay, so we're talking, you're in the 50 to 75 range. The majority of you are in the 25 to 50% range of your exercises use elastic resistance. And that's great because not everything needs elastic and not anyone should eliminate elastic. It's just a unique mode of training where the tension comes from the band as opposed to the body or, or the weight itself. So it's important for us to understand a little bit of background behind this to actually use it properly because a lot of people use it improperly. And just like anything, if you use a dumbbell improperly, a barbell improperly, an elastic band improperly, you're not gonna get the most effective results that you can get out of this. So research-wise, there is a litany of research all over the place, recent, old, doesn't matter, that demonstrates that elastic resistance does basically the same thing to the body that uh, weights do, that isotonic resistance does. So they compare and they say, okay, we have similar physiologic responses, meaning you still get hypertrophy, you still get strength gains, you still get DOMS, you get all these things. You have s no difference in strength outcomes in all these studies showing that people that work out with elastic band or people that work out with weights have the same strength outcome. They still get stronger. And the EMG profiles are very similar. So when you match the resistance of the band to the weight, you can absolutely get the same effect out of the body. Just a couple of examples. Abu, sorry, Abu Darba up in um, uh, Canada did a study where they compared knee extension with a TheraBand and the Nautilus machine. And you notice here, five sets of a 10 rep max. So they're matching the resistance. They're saying, we're gonna give you all you can do to get five sets 10 times. We're not gonna give you a, a in TheraBand lingo, a yellow band that is really low resistance and have that be not difficult for you. We're gonna match it and we're gonna get the same results. Another study compared neuromuscular characteristics of a biceps during an arm curl using tubing and isotonic weights. You get, they, they believe that you get better neuromuscular activation. So if you're working out with clients that are maybe, uh, that need a little bit more neuromuscular control, maybe they have a, a long-standing comorbidity of um, neurologic insult, or maybe they just are, are not, not working the way you think that their body's supposed to work, giving them an elastic band may help them. Uh, also, here's another one out of Denmark, a study done by Lars Anderson, where he's looking at three exercises using dumbbells in TheraBand. And what they found was that there's no real difference in the EMGs. They both can be effective. So it's not like one is better than the other. It's just that they're different. And different is good because different means that you have then more tools to be able to access for your client. Again, looking here, this is out of Spain, Juan Carlos Colado. Notice, same exercises maxed, uh, matched intensity with a rating of perceived exertion. So we have a few different ex studies that will go into rating of perceived exertion. We'll talk about that in just a second, some different ways to utilize it. And then against weight machines, um, same thing, now looking at Nautilus machines and, and uh, larger techno gym machines, and you get the same results. So the, the thing about TheraBand, or elastic resistance, it's, it's not, uh, dependent to TheraBand, I just call it TheraBand, it's kind of like Kleenex, you know, you don't say hand me the facial tissue, you say hand me the TheraBand. So the thing about, about elastic resistance is that the, the band gets more difficult the more you pull it, right? So the, the force, if we were to look at it, can I hand you that please? Okay, so if I stand like this and I pull, the force is completely, it's, it's, it's just linear, right? It's going up and up and up. Well, what we also find is that at some point, thank you, at some point, this becomes an exponential increase. 
that it just starts to shoot off the charts. But when we stay in the extension range of about 200 to 300% um, elongation of the band, what we find is that that relevant force is a linear increase. It doesn't get to exponential. It doesn't get that far, okay? You, you get that far, you're getting to the point where you're gonna break the band and then it's, it's dangerous at that level. So the force of elastic resistance is dependent on three things. It's dependent on the cross-sectional area of the band, the change in length, and then the elastic modulus or the coefficient. So if you've ever seen different bands like this yellow and green TheraBand, the only difference between these two bands is that the green one, besides being dyed the color green, has more stuff in it. It's thicker, okay? So it's the same width this way. The change in length is gonna be dependent on how we start and finish the exercise. But if you were to look at the thickness or the height of the band, depending on which way you look at it, it's thicker. So it has more stuff. So the cross-sectional area is higher, therefore the force goes up and it's a more difficult resistance piece. The change in length, though, is, is the interesting part. Can I borrow you for a second? You, all you that get to sit in front, you get to be volunteered. Stand up for me, please. Okay, so if we look at change in length and we say, okay, we're going to start with about, you know, a one-yard strip of band, okay? And at one yard, if we extend this, go ahead and step that way until you get to about two yards. Okay, good. So now we have two yards. So we've elongated the band 100% of its original resting length. We started with one yard, we doubled it, and that becomes a 100% increase, okay? Now if I go to three yards, oh, I'm just kidding. If I go to three yards, okay, now I have a 200% elongation in the length of the band, and my force is gonna be reflective of that. So at 100% elongation, there is a certain increase in resistance. At 200% elongation, there is a greater increase in resistance and a greater force, okay? Now, if we were to start with the band being about two yards and we extend to four yards, what is our percent elongation? 100%, okay? And if we go to six yards, what's our percent elongation? 200%, six minus two, okay, uh, divided by two, four divided by two is 200%. That resistance is the exact same as starting at one yard and going to two yards and then going to three yards. They are the exact same forces because if you look here, the force is dependent on the cross-sectional area of the band, we didn't change the band, the elastic coefficient of the band, we didn't change the band, and the change in length. We didn't change the, the percent elongation. We kept it constant. So we could start with a six inch strip and go to 12 inches and that's the same force that's required as going from one yard to two yards. Does that make sense? And that's a key, key principle. Thank you very much, appreciate it. That is a key principle for us being able to dose our exercise because then we can s use a starting length that is the appropriate length for the exercise and know what force we're getting into. Now every once in a while, every once in a while people try to do different things with band. And here's an example where they've, uh, I think this occurred in West Virginia. Sorry if anyone here is from West Virginia. There you go. I tell you bungee jump with no bridge. There you go. That is an off-label use, by the way, of a band. <laughs> All right, so we've covered force. Now let's talk about torque, because torque is really much more important to us. Why is torque more important to us? Question, do we generate, when we move, when we lift weights, when we do anything, do we generate force or torque? We generate torque. Everything we do is involving a lever arm. If I take a dumbbell and if I do a biceps curl, the torque is based on the length of my lever, lever arm. If I do a lift with my arm like this, there is gonna be a certain increase in experience to my body that my body will experience because now I'm moving the weight with a longer lever arm and I have to, I have to use my muscles differently. So if I had a 10 pound dumbbell 
and I did a shoulder flexion, that's going to be easier than doing a straight arm shoulder flexion. Yes? Because of torque. And that's what we do in life is we generate torque. So torque is really the key for us to think about. And when we get down to it, we first have to go back to the muscle strength curve. And we know that the strength curve of a muscle is bell-shaped. You're weakest at end point, you're weakest at end point, you're strongest in the center, right? So starting, ending, strongest in the center, and it's bell-shaped. And we believe this to be so because it overlaps with the strength curve of a muscle. So if you look at the strength curve of a muscle, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the, sorry, the um, actin myosin concept or, or sliding filament theory of the muscle. If you look at it and say, okay, the actin and myosin at its elongated state is very not overlapped, okay, it's minimally overlapped, and when it's minimally overlapped, it's not going to be able to grab on itself and create tension. And then when you get into the optimal length in the mid-range here, you get a much more optimal overlapping. And then when you get into the shortened state, you get too much overlapping, and again, we can't generate that much tension. This sliding filament theory is, is what brings us this, this uh, bell-shaped strength curve of a muscle. So when we are doing an exercise, it is extremely important that we match the ability of the muscle to the exercise, to the difficulty of the exercise. Now, I know this sounds very simple and very straightforward. I mean, duh, you don't want to have someone do something that's too easy or too hard for them. But sometimes people shift this curve. So they might take this moment of the exercise curve and by just having poor positioning or poor understanding of the, of the equipment, they might shift this. And by shifting that, you place the difficulty at parts of the muscle that are not able to maintain that difficulty. And then you end up getting substitution. And so you end up getting people that fail and their form breaks down. So when you're having someone do, I'm a, I'm a kettlebell guy, right? And when you're having someone do like an overhead press with a kettlebell and they're standing there and they're starting out like this and then all of a sudden they start doing that little move, right? They've broken down, they have to substitute. The moment of that exercise has become greater than the ability for their muscle to perform that movement. Bands are the exact same way and we can position ourselves and use them properly to get that moment of the exercise to match. Okay, and we'll go over that. So in elastic resistance, our torque curve has been shown by multiple studies, and this one starting with Hughes in 1999. If you look at the colors of these curves, we have silver, black, uh, blue, green, red, and yellow. Those curves are bell-shaped. The hashed lines in that picture are five and 10 pound dumbbells, respectively, five and then 10 pounds. And you see those are also bell-shaped. So when you put this on the body, when you take this band and give it to the body, and say, I want you to do an exercise, in this case it was shoulder abduction, you get a bell-shaped uh, torque curve. So we have a linear force curve and a bell-shaped torque curve. Why is that the case? How is that possible? How is it possible that when you have this linear increasing force curve, where some people, in, especially in my world in physical therapy, refuse to use bands because they think it just gets progressively more difficult, and as it gets progressively more difficult, the body can't do that. So we've mismatched that moment of the muscle for th in the moment of the exercise. They're not in line and sync with each other. So why is that? It's all based on force angle. And this is where patient positioning is really, really important. Can we pass out the, the things? Now, we're gonna give you something here um, that has, has never been seen in the, in the history of the world except for like 15 people and they're all dead now. Um, I'm just kidding. So, okay, so TheraBand has come up with a new, a new piece of equipment, and this is gonna be here for you guys to try. This is not for you to keep. You, they do need these back. But this is something called CLX, which stands for consecutive loops. And the X is basically however long you want it to be. So you, it could be nine loops, it could be five loops, it can be whatever. And we're gonna be using this today and go through this, but we're gonna, um, what I want you to do is once you get your band, I want you to stand up and we're gonna feel some of these principles of force angles and we're gonna feel what it's like and then, and then learn how to position that to our body properly. So what I want you to do is just put your hand in, in one of the loops just at the end of it, okay? So in the first loop we'll call it. And then you can take the other end and you can put it, you can either put your foot in it or you can just stand on it for now, okay? 
So what I want you to do is to make sure that you're going to hold it in the same hand as you're standing on it. So if you're holding it in your right hand, stand on it with your right foot. And I want the band to have essentially no slack. So I don't want it to be slacked and I don't want it to be tensioned at this resting position. Now what do you feel right now? Do you feel any, any working in your arm, in your shoulder, in your deltoid? Do you feel anything or do you just feel completely relaxed? Completely relaxed, right? Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to raise this up to about 90 degrees. And you should start to feel, if we, do, do we have any more? We should start to feel some resistance, yes? You start to feel it in your deltoid, you start to feel it, yes? How do you make that easier? Go all the way up to the top. Feel that go away? Okay, and then back down to here, and you feel it come back on, yes? And then you go back down to the bottom, and you feel it go away. Now why is that? That is because of force angle. So as the force angle increases in the body, the, the joint angle decreases and vice versa. So you, we started out with our band at our side, and with our band at our side, holding this, we had a force angle of what? Between my arm and the band, what is the angle of that? Zero could be correct, but it's not. What's the angle between this and this? 180, thank you. It's a line, okay, 180 degrees. And my joint angle is zero degrees. As I move up, now I get something that's closer to 90 between the band and my arm, and my joint angle is closer to 90. As I move up to my joint angle of 180, my band and my arm have a force angle of zero because they're on top of each other, yes? So that changes throughout the motion when positioned properly. Now, the torque is figured out in elastic resistance by adding the sign of the force angle. And I know we all remember trigonometry like it was yesterday and we love it. So let's go through it. So the sign of zero degrees is zero. The sign of 180 is zero. The sign of 90 is one. So what we get is at 90 degrees of a force angle, we have basically the maximum amount of torque we can have because we have one. Anything between zero and 90 degrees of force angle is going to be less than one. Anything between 90 and 180 is less than one. So what we have is we have a torque curve that, look at this, matches the sine curve. It's bell-shaped. And sine is what creates torque for us. Sine is what creates it. So torque is equal to the force, which we've said is elastic modulus times the cross-sectional area times the change in length times the lever arm, the length of the lever arm, times the sine of the force angle. So as we get the sine of 90, we're gonna get to the maximum amount of torque, which is why patient positioning is so important to us. If we are doing shoulder abduction, and you want someone to go through the full range of, of the movement, then they should be positioned with the band underneath their ipsilateral foot that they're holding it in their hand, and they should be able to do a shoulder abduction. If you want to do a shoulder press, it's the same thing. If you want to do a bicep curl, it's the same thing. You don't stand on the band over here and do the curl. You don't stand on the band and do a shoulder press there because it's pulling me over. So one way to experience this is to now hold the put step on it in the opposite foot and take a good stride, a wide stride, a wide stance, okay? Hold that in your hand. Hold in the other hand now, so the right hand, left foot, left hand, right foot, whatever, whatever you want. And now you are going to raise it up to where your arm is in line with the band. And you should feel essentially no uh, resistance on the deltoid. As you come all the way up, now it's starting to pull you over. Keep your arm straight. Now it's starting to pull you over and you can feel some, some difficulty. If you want to make that easy, bring it back down in line and you can feel that the torque changes. Now you still have compression occurring from the, from the band, compressing your shoulder, but you can feel it change. So patient positioning is vital when we do these exercises. It's really vital when you're doing a single joint exercise with a band. Okay, so let's go into the, uh, the next stage, which is really getting into function. Okay, the, the function of how we, why we use these things and what they're important for. So, when I was in, if you want to sit, you can sit, that's fine. When I was in um, physical therapy school, 
I, I knew that I, I wanted to do sports and orthopedic physical therapy. That was, was all I wanted to do. I wanted to do sports. I hated neuro class, applied neurobiology. I couldn't stand it. I didn't like it. I didn't want to continue with it. So I didn't, I, I, but I had to take it. But I hated it, and I said, you know what? I'm never going to do neuro PT. Why do I worry about this? Now, how many has a, have a similar story in that in their route, in their route to personal training and to, and to working with clients that you wanted to work with athletes and you wanted to work with people who are looking to become like that? Anyone like that? Yes? Okay, I see a lot of nods and about two arms. The other one's retired from lifting their arm with the band. <laughs> um, so, so you see this, you, you see this commonly, I would say, right? So what I realized, though, is that I'm always working on the nervous system. Everything I do is on the nervous system. Perfect example, if you are starting with a new client and you're just getting them involved in strength training, three weeks into strength training, they are able to move more weight, right? Why? Why is that? Yeah, exactly, neurological adaptation, CNS is working. Their brain is stronger, okay? You've made their brain stronger. So by making their brain stronger, you haven't done anything to their muscles, but everything is working closer. It, it understands how to do that movement, it understands how to do it better and do it more efficiently. So all of us are doing that all the time. And I think sometimes that gets lost in, in the way we are thinking about these things, which is one of the reasons why I love bands so much, because I can stimulate that really well. And I can stimulate it in ways that people never even realized. And hopefully later on this morning, you guys will experience some of this. So we have a lot that, that comes into the body. The brain processes it and then pushes it out. There's a saying, crap in equals crap out, right? If you get bad information coming into the brain, you're going to get bad information going out to the body. So we need to improve that information coming into the brain. So I think about these things, we think about these things called muscular chains and slings and chains. Now there's an interesting little, little um, theory about the anatomy of the body and the way it was designed. So the, if I start with my left plantar fascia, and if I look at the fascia, the connective tissue between my muscles and tendons and so on, if I look at that fascia, I can actually piece out the fascia from my left plantar fascia into my left Achilles, into my left gastroc soleus complex. The ga lateral gas gastroc head works into the distal IT band. Then that works into fascially into the uh, quadriceps vastus lateralis and therefore the whole quadriceps, which then up the IT band of the quadriceps works into the tensor fascia lata. The tensor fascia lata originates from the gluteal aponeurosis with the left gluteus maximus. The left gluteus maximus goes into the thoracolumbar fascia, contralaterally into the contralateral latissimus dorsi. The latissimus dorsi connects to the humerus, and all of a sudden, I now have a connection between my right arm and my left foot through an anatomical connection of fascia. So, it, so foot positioning actually matters when we're thinking about the movement that we're doing. So can I borrow you now? Come up here. You look strong. Stronger than me, maybe? We'll see. I doubt it. Yeah, I can. I'm kidding. <laughs> it took me uh, at least a day to get a body like this. Um, so so, <laughs> so what, what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and put right foot forward, okay? And I want you to put left arm forward, okay? Yeah, just like that. Now, what I'm going to do is I want you to go arm straight, and I'm going to resist this, and I want you to give me all the resistance you can give me, okay, to push your arm forward into flexion. So go ahead. No, arm straight. Arm straight. There you go. Okay. So, I mean, I'm pushing with all I got, and that's pretty strong, yeah? yeah. Want, want to know how to make that harder and therefore not as appropriate for the body? Switch your feet. Yep. Left arm forward. Go ahead. Push. See that? Beca the reason is, is I have now put his body in a disadvantage to no longer taking advantage of this fascial connection that I have between my left foot and my right shoulder, my right arm. I've put his body in a disadvantage. Now, the other thing to think about is the neurologic side. So we have the anatomical side and we have the neurologic side. The neurologic side says what? When my left foot is forward, my brain wants my right arm to be forward. Why? Because that's the way we walk, right? Only the beetles walk like this. So, so we walk opposite arm and leg. 
So when I am giving him an exercise and I'm thinking about the positioning, what, what I want to work, we should be thinking about the positioning of the feet because it's either going to turn on or off a muscle. And we don't want to have this left foot forward, left arm forward si situation because we're just not going to get the most use out of our muscle. It's not like, oh, that makes it weaker, so therefore we can make it stronger. No, it's not weaker. He's not any weaker by positioning his left foot forward. His brain's just not working. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so we, th we, we think about these things. We also think about the way the body learned to move in the developmental stages. So we look at babies and we say, okay, babies, when they are born, their first task is to be able to stabilize in the sagittal plane on their backs, arms up, feet up, to be able to grab and reach things and prehense things. So we can take advantage of that when we are rehabbing someone or when we're training someone. And if they can't do a squat like this, well, he's doing a squat on his back. So if they can't stabilize their body in a squat upright, you can get them on their back and do squat supine. That's not necessarily a leg press, you, which is one way, but you can also use these bands to be, able to, stable, to be able to work the body to resist that by putting feet in the loops and hands in the loops. And you can do an overhead deep squat supine. Okay, that's, that's something that we should be thinking about. And then you see here into crawling and creeping and then ultimately into gait. And finally, at, at the age of a year and a half or so, we're able to be fully upright and assume this upright walking position, this extension position. Okay. So as a w result of the way our body develops, the, there's a belief that we have these chains of muscles. We have tonic muscles and phasic muscles. And we'll, we'll show you a list here. And these are called upper quarter chain. And then we have lower quarter chains of tonic and phasic muscles. And ultimately, what happens is these muscles become imbalanced. And this muscle imbalance is a predictable and systematic response of, this mo of the motor system. So a change in one place is going to be reflected by changes elsewhere in the body. And the phrase that we use are that tonic muscles are prone to tightness, or tonics are too tight. And then phasic muscles are prone to weakness, or phasics fail to fire. Now, that does not mean that phasics are weak. It does not mean that tonics are strong. Generally speaking, phasics don't work as well as they need to. Generally speaking, tonic muscles are tight. A tight muscle, is a tight muscle always a strong muscle? Absolutely not. So that doesn't mean that they're strong. So when we look at these, these muscles, you look at all these muscles here that are on the tonic list, and these are all the muscles that we do what to? What do we do to these muscles? Well, we overcompensate, sure, but when, when, like if we're working out with a client or on ourselves, what do we do with these muscles? We stretch them. You stretch them. Stretch your gastroc, stretch your hamstrings, stretch your hip flexors, stretch your upper traps, stretch your pecs. Right? I worked out with my trainer yesterday morning, and at the end, I had a uh, piriformis stretch, I had a hip flexor stretch, I had uh, pec stretches, I had lat stretches. I, right? These are what, so what we do. We stretch them. We also massage them. We get them to relax. In our world, these are every muscles that patients complain about that are painful. And then we have the list of phasics. And these phasics are the muscles that we're always trying to strengthen and stabilize. The serratus anterior, the lower trap, the mid trap. We get into the, the lower back, the glute max, the, the glute meds, um, quadriceps, tibialis anterior. These are all muscles that we're trying to, the core abdominal muscles are all muscles that we're trying to stabilize. Now, when we have this imbalance, we can end up having joint pathology that is a result of this muscle imbalance. And by having this joint pathology and this muscle imbalance, we end up leading to this vicious cycle that we call it of having these unbalanced forces that ultimately create abnormal joint biomechanics, abnormal movement patterns, which then creates an altered motor program, which then creates joint dysfunction and again leads to more unbalanced forces. So we have to be able to reposition re that for the body. And we can do this through different exercises and, and working on what, what we call that sensor motor system, working on getting the crap in to be better, and therefore the crap out is not crap. So 
these, these lesions, the, these um, muscle imbalances are actually similar to what we see in spastic central nervous system lesions. So if you think about someone that has a stroke, oftentimes they get into this flexed posture and we try to get them out of that posture. Well, this is essentially an exaggerated sense of the tonics being too tight. Wrist flexors are tonics, finger flexors are tonics, shoulder internal rotators and adductors are tonics, elbow flexors are tonics. These are all tonic muscles, and so they appear to be too tight. Now, what we can end up having in the body and what we normally have are upper and lower cross syndrome. Has anyone ever heard of, of these? Dr. Yonda and upper and lower cross syndrome, very good. In the PT world, no one's ever heard of these. So I, I, it's shocking to me when I teach, but they never have. Chiropractic knows them a little bit more. So we end up having this weak cervical, deep cervical flexor that is uh, directly opposed to these tight cervical extensors, and then we have tight chest muscles, pec muscles, and then again weak uh, muscles trying to balance them out in the middle and lower traps and, and straightest inferior. And that will create the position that looks like this. That's pretty much, honestly, every one of us and every one of our clients, yes? And then we have lower cross syndrome, which again is this weak abdominal and weak glutes trying to be balanced out by these tight hip flexors and tight lower back muscles, which creates this, this position right here, right? So we need to, we need to consider these as we go through our rehab. So let's, let's bring it together. Unfortunately, we have people that are, well, what we call them, we call them motor morons, okay? We have people that, you know, you like teach them an exercise, you say, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do this exercise, right? Or that exercise. You say, I want you to do that exercise. And then you say, okay, do it. And they go, and you're like, no, that's not what I was talking about, right? That's a motor moron. Well, this is actual training of the Iraqi military. Doing jumping jacks. This guy is awesome. And look at this guy. He's just dancing. So, boy. A couple of them got it. This guy's good. Look at this guy. He's like... Wow, yeah. So these, this is not what we're looking for here, okay? It's not what we're looking for. So we can actually decrease that motor moronism by using the body in ways that we call stealth and vector exercises. So vector training is creating a resistance in the vector of the, of the direction of movement using the band and then also creating vectors of assistance as well, which we can do. And stealth exercises are basically just saying to the body, we want you to activate this muscle without thinking about activating this muscle, okay? So, I talked about rating of perceived exertion. Um, how many of you use this daily on your people, on every single one of your clients you use a rating of perceived exertion? Okay, how about like 75% every visit they come in? How about 50, 25, pretty much never? Okay, yeah, and that's pretty common. I mean, again, my trainer never asks me, what are you working out at? He asks me, is it easy or is it hard? That's what he asks me, right? Well, that's a little bit difficult to tell. So this guy Borg came up with this Borg scale, which is from six to 20. From six to 20, now does anyone know why it's six to 20? Yes. That was very good. Good job. So it was based on the uh, heart rate. If you add a zero after the six all the way down, you get 60 to 200. So the idea is your resting heart rate 60, your maximum heart rate is 200. So somewhere in there. And generally speaking, in, in our rehab world, we want to be in the 12 to 14. And depending on what you're trying to do with your people, you may want to be higher, you may want to be lower. It all depends on the exercise that you're doing. Right? Well, this is a little bit confusing, six to 20. So this guy, Robert Robertson, who has the best name in the world, <laughs> he, he came up with the Omni scale, which is zero to 10, which is a whole lot more understandable for, for us. And he also put pictures with it and then made it inclinating. So he has a whole bunch of different Omni scales for the different uh, modalities that people can use. Here's one using uh, dumbbells, I'm sorry, barbells. And what you can see is that, again, five to seven, is roughly 12 to 14. Now Juan Carlos Collado validated that the Omni scale can be used in elastic resistance 
to be able to determine how hard people are working out at. So again, doing that exercise at the, at the matched RPE, rating of perceived exertion, he used the Omni scale. Uh, Lars Anderson in Denmark and Juan Carlos Collado have also used the Borg scale to validate it. So we know that if you work out at a certain RPE, you can get the effects that you need to get. So it's important to ask people how difficult the exercise is, not just on a is it easy, is it hard, but potentially on a zero to 10 scale or TheraBand has come up with the resistance intensity scale for exercise, which is the rise. And you can see here, that's also been validated by Juan Carlos Collado as compared to the zero to 10 Omni scale. And generally speaking, we have people working out at a moderate. That's again in our rehab world. You, d you guys may want to be anywhere from, from easy to maximal. It depends on, on what you're doing and when you're doing it, right? So we want to think about these RPEs as we're giving the people the exercise. And I think that's the biggest knock on, on elastic resistance all the time is it's too easy. Well, I promise you, a good friend of mine, Andre Lobby, spent a year with the New Orleans Saints, Saints, and he would go in with this yellow band, and he would just, I mean, the, the, these football linemen would look at him and laugh. And by the end of five minutes, they'd be, they'd be crying and saying, wow, this is actually really hard. I didn't realize that a band could be this difficult. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a couple of exercises on, right now, glute activation. So glutes. We can do something very simple. Go ahead and stand up, grab your bands. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so what we can do is we can do some very simple exercises just by taking this loop. Now I want you to loop this all the way around your foot and into your ankle. So just go around your shoe there. And then you can step on it. And we can work out the glutes just by having this band around our ankle and doing hip abduction, hip flexion, extension, whatever you want. Now the cool thing is this is one of those examples of a stealth exercise where really we're working the stance leg, right? So no one's telling you to exercise that stance leg. All I'm saying to you as your trainer is saying, okay, I want you to take your right leg and I want you to move it into abduction, I want you to move in flexion, whatever you're doing, and I want you to keep your posture straight. I don't want your hip to drop. So that's an exercise that we can do. Now some people have pain doing a movement like hip abduction if they're having a painful hip. So you can strengthen the hip by not moving it, by standing on it, and that's our focus, and that's something that we can do very simply with the band. We can also work on different ways to activate the core. So take this band again, Take it off your foot. And we do something called multiplanar vertical stabilization. Now what you do is you just move your, band, your hands in the loops to the desired length. And normally speaking, that desired length is going to be to have minimal slack in the band at this resting position. But now I can do an exercise where I stabilize my core by just working my arms out to the side. Now, how do you know I'm stabilizing my core? Because in every movement that involves the arms, the transverse abdominus fires first. It's the first thing to fire. So we can do different planes of movement with this band to be able to stabilize. You can then step on the middle of the band and you can either reposition your hands or you can or you can um, keep your hands in the same spot depending on where you had, had them. Just move your hands to a different loop. And then again, you can do now a sagittal plane or a frontal plane stabilization. You could advance this into a single leg, however you want. But now you can start to do exercises using elastics that are designed for something entirely different than what's moving right, while still moving the arms. So instead of just having to do a crunch or some sort of sit up like that, I can work my arms and my core at the same time. And I know there's a billion other exercises that you guys can think of like this. I just want to show you a few. Here's another one that you can do, overhead core stabilization. Keep that, keep that good position of the, of the trunk, little bit of arch in the lower back, keeping the sternum close to the belt line without allowing that to flare, your ribs to flare arms overhead and back down. You're going to get a nice eccentric and concentric control using the band. 
Yeah, this is something that we call the lower body brugers. And the lower body brugers, this is a cool exercise, is a way to be able to exercise all of the, of the uh, muscles of the hips, the core, all the way down to the, uh, the feet and ankles. So um, anyone want to try this? Okay, come on up. Come, come with me, and you guys are going to, I'm going to demonstrate on her, and you guys can watch while we're doing this. And go ahead, if you want to borrow someone next to you to set yourself up, or if you want to set yourself up, feel free to do it. So go ahead and lie down your back. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this band, we're going to start in the middle loops, okay, and we're going to put her feet through it. You okay with this? Oh, we're good. Don't rip the band. <laughs> These bands are so new that I think they were literally manufactured yesterday, <laughs> okay? So now what I have is I have the, I have the feet in loops, okay? I am going to cross... So bring this together. I'm going to cross, and I want them to be in consecutive loops. Behind, okay? Then I'm going to bring this up, and now what I want you to do is put your hand into that loop, into that loop. There you go, that hand. And we're going to cross again. Now with a silver, this is not easy, okay? Put your hands down at your side. <laughs> there you go, good. Now what she's going to do is she's going to move everything into this extension position. So what I want is I want her to go feet up and out, good. And then because I have resistance here, we're going to go hips up, knees a little bit apart, and she's going to hold that position, and then she's going to slowly unwind. So bring your knees back together a little bit, and then your hips down, and then your feet back together and down. Now you could start this with a nice abdominal brace so you can go activation in the brace. Glute set, keep your knees together a little bit more, glute set. Feet up and out, hips up, knees apart, hold, and then slowly knees back together, hips down, feet back to down, and then glute set, let go, and abdominal brace let go. Okay? These exercises and everything else, I'm just going to flip through, and you guys have pictures of all of these in your books, but these exercises are all available on therabandacademy.com. Okay? Um, you can see some of these things like a shoulder sling exercise, videos of these exercises are all available. Um, scapular stabilizers. I wanted to give you a whole list of stuff that you can take home for all different parts of the body. And I know that you guys are experts in movement and, and strength, so you know how to be able to add all these things together and um, have fun with them, okay? Any questions for me? I think I've gotten the hook. I went long. I think originally, originally I thought I had the full hour, not 50 minutes, so that's my fault. <laughs> Any questions for me?